So, is this okay? Today we're diving into week three of our summer uh, series in the book of Revelation. Uh, looking at how God would have us respond when, when life's uncertainties, when life's troubles and tribulations just absolutely stand in our face and scream and yell and jump at us and, and just try to distract us from God. Let's recap the, the last two weeks, especially for those of you who haven't been with us. During week one, which we looked at Revelation chapter one, we heard that no matter what comes our way, that we can really rest in that, that peace of the Lord, that peace that surpasses all understanding because Jesus is holding us in the palm of his right hand. And so that is the basis of everything else that we're looking at. Jesus has us. And as long as he has us, no matter what comes our way, we can have peace. Well, then dovetailing upon that last week in week number two, we looked at Jesus' letter to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And really within those letters, kind of skimming them, if you will, we saw how Jesus really implores us to remain in him so that through his victory, we can be victorious over those dark things of the world that want to pull us away from God, that want to distract us from God, and from those dark areas of our heart, from that love that's grown cold, if you will, that wants to distract us from keeping our focus on God and staying in God. But a question that can kind of arise from this is really this. How do we do that when the uncertainties of this world, when troubles, tribulations, are just all around us, when they're surrounding us, when they're in our face. What do we do when those uncertainties of the world are causing life to get out of focus and be a little bit blurry? Well, no, I'm pun intended, but that is really the focus for today, as we're going to hear in Revelations chapter 4 and 5, as we're going to move very quickly through these two books, putting a lot more emphasis in Revelation chapter 5 than we are in chapter 4. So with that... We're going to transition, but before we do, we're all going to do a little fun exercise. I got a little bit of a Lutran exercise for us all to do this morning. So everybody, right where you're at, you don't have to stand up and do any calisthenics or, any, or anything like that. We're not going to march around the sanctuary five times or anything. But right in front of you, somewhere in your row, in your pew, should be at least one green Lutheran book of worship. If there is, please grab it and open it up to page 81. If you don't see one, just, you know, maybe look at another row. If there aren't enough, share with your neighbor, but turn to page 81 of the LBW. And for those of you sitting in the chairs in the back, just take my word for it. <laughs> because moments ago, right, and kudos to all of us, right? Especially for the Kyrie, because we had no accompaniment, right? But moments ago, just after we sang the Kyrie, we sang that this is the feast, or the Alleluia, that you see on page 81. And to me, it says a whole lot that the author of the authors, there were many of them, the combined authors from various different Lutheran denominations who came together, included a song, they wrote their own song, if you will, inspired by Scripture, right from Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. And I believe they did that to help us keep our focus on God and the things that are not of this world. Okay, so with their inspiration, with the song that we sang just moments ago and with what you're seeing on page 81, Let's now dig in to Revelation chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 6, verse 6, excuse me, and I will now read through verse 14. Excuse me as I do a little bit of a jostling here. And we hear this, and John wrote, Then I saw a lamb that looked as if it had been slaughtered, but it was now standing between the throne and the four living beings and among the 24 elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which represent the sevenfold spirit of God that is sent out into every part of the earth. He stepped forward and took the scroll from the right hand of the one sitting on the throne. 
And when he took the scroll, the four living beings and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they had golden bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song with these words, You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it, for you were slaughtered. And your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have caused them to become a kingdom of priests for our God, and they will reign on earth. Then I looked again, and I heard the voices of thousands and thousands and millions and millions of angels around the throne and around the living beings and the elders. And they sang in a mighty chorus, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea. And they sang, blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one who is sitting on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And then the four living beings said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped the Lamb. The first thing I really want you to notice is that here in this passage, in this portion of Revelation chapter 5, Jesus is the focal point. All eyes are on Jesus. He is the center of all heavenly worship and the center of all heavenly activity. Now, when you go homes after service today and sometime this week, open up your Bibles to Revelation chapter 4 and read that. By the way, that's an assignment for you to do this week. Go back and read Revelation chapter 4. I want you to notice that the Lord God, the Father, but I'm going to say the Lord God in his fullness is the focal point. He's the center of all attention in Revelation chapter 4. In verse 8 of Revelation chapter 4, we hear these four living creatures. These are the, these are the angelic heavenly hosts that are described in a way that just blows our mind, right? With, with four wings and eyes all around its bodies with, with, the, with just different heads and they just they look magnificent. But they sing this song to the Lord God Almighty and they sing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Now we know that the one who is to come, at least in the second coming, will be Jesus Christ our Lord. In verse 11, 11 excuse me, right, right below that, we hear the 24 elders bowing down before their Lord, casting their golden crowns before him, singing, Worthy are you, O Lord God, to receive honor and power and glory, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. And within these verses, within this chapter, all of the imagery... John is pointing our eyes to the Father sitting upon the throne. Yet we can't diminish the fullness of God because the Holy Spirit is there. He's, he's represented by what we hear, the sevenfold Spirit of God who's been sent out into all the earth and to the Son who is also present. So the, while the Father himself is the one in focus, John is looking upon the throne and he is seeing the Father. We can't diminish that the Trinity, the whole, the fullness of God is present in that scene. Does that make sense? But then as we turn the page from chapter 4 into chapter 5, the Apostle John refocuses our vision. He refocuses our eyes as he transitions from Father to to son. And to hear about that, we go back to Revelation chapter 5, now to verses 1 through 5, which I believe we just heard in our first reading. But let's hear it again. And John wrote this, Then I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one who was sitting on the throne. So God the Father is holding this scroll. And he says, There was writing on the inside and the outside of the scroll, and it was sealed with seven seals. We're going to get to those in the next few weeks. And I saw a strong angel who shouted with a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the, scroll, the seals on this scroll and open it? But no one in heaven or under heaven was able and worthy to open the scroll. But one of the 24 elders said to me, Stop weeping. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir to King David's throne, has won the victory. He is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals. Note there in verse 5, 
what one of God's 24 elders said. He said, the line of Judah, the heir to David's throne, he has won the victory. Remember last week we talked about victory, having victory in God through Christ Jesus, having victory over those dark areas of our lives. Well, that victory that we are called to have is impossible without the first victory of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. The elder is saying, Jesus was victorious so that you could be victorious in him is, is, is somewhat what we can read between the lines. Moreover, I want you to hear this, that Jesus' victory over death and the grave can help us then focus on God and help us focus on our eternal hope and thereby let the problems of this world, these uncertainties that we've been chatting about, can blur and fade into the background. Because as we heard earlier in verse 6, and we'll put that on the screen, Jesus won the victory for us. He ransomed us with his blood in order to secure for us an eternal destiny with God the Father in heaven. And because of all this, heaven is singing a song. They're singing a brand new song. And it's the song that we see mimicked, if you will, a song that we see repeated almost verbatim in our traditional worship here on Sunday mornings in the Lutheran Book of Worship. And to me, that song that we sing every single week, it's not just about being wrote. It's not just about something to sing every week because that's what we do. It should be a reminder for me and a reminder for you that we are to keep our focal point on God in heaven, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that we should keep our focal point heaven-bound and to live for God and worship and to praise him with all of our thoughts, our actions, our, our words, the whole fabric of our being. Because as we hear, heaven's focal point is God. And because heaven's focal point is God, God should be our focal point too. Even when life gets hard, even when troubles and tribulations come upon us, even when uncertainties come at us and, and smack us in the face and just catch us off guard, and they try to steal the thunder from God in our lives. That happened to Danielle and I this week. And the only thing we could do was take it to God in prayer. And God resolved the issue. Because, you know, when life gets chaotic, everything else can get blurry. When a problem arises, it's easy to focus on that problem. Wouldn't you agree? So much so that we tend to shrug and put other things off, maybe that are far more important, especially God the Father and his kingdom, because we are so fixated on, on this problem that plagues us. And those problems cause everything else to blur in the background. But these chapters that we're reading here, and, and especially those that are coming behind it, that we're going to hear about in the next few weeks, can help us that the problems, the uncertainties of life that we face, that are caused by the world, will one day come to an end when Jesus unseals the seven seals that are upon the scroll and starts to begin the process of putting an end to evil and to begin his millennial kingdom reign. And of course, that's something that every Christian should want. We should want to end an evil. We, would, we desire that deep in our hearts. I think deep down, we all desire and wish to have an end to suffering and troubles and tribulations and pains. And I think deep down in our hearts, every one of us longs for that joy and that peace and that beauty and the glory and the love to be in the presence of God the Father in heaven above. Amen? So while we can't eradicate life's troubles, your troubles, your tribulations can fade just a bit into the background. They can come out of focus as you focus more on God in heaven than your problems on earth. Does that make sense? It's all about our perspective in life. And that's important. Because now we're going to shift focus once again. Because I want you to see how Jesus sees you. I want you to see how heaven sees you. 
We're going to go back again, and we're going to read verse 8, because this is really easy to miss. It's easy to skim over it, but let's look at it carefully and look at these words. John wrote, And when Jesus took the scroll, when he took the scroll, the four living beings and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they had gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of God's people. In this scene, while the focus is on Jesus as the Lamb of God, who John is now seeing, not in his glorified state, but as one who had been slain, as though John was still seeing him, as though he had been on the cross, the slain Jesus Christ upon the cross, while the focus is on Jesus, the Lamb of God, John's focus now shifts, kind of like in a movie scene where the scene just slightly shifts ever so being. Jesus is still there. He's right in the background, but right before him. So Jesus is here. The Father's behind him. There's this heavenly riot of angels around him. But what John's eyes are now seeing are the 24 elders, and they're holding these ice picture them to these giant bowls made of gold, and they have incense and smoke just pouring out of them. And these are your prayers. These are your prayers when life gets hard. These are your prayers for your friends, your family, your loved ones. These are the prayers when, when tribulation is upon the world and God is seeing these prayers. He's smelling these prayers. Think of incense. Think of a, a punk that you light in your home. How that fills the atmosphere. And so you get this picture of these prayers of the saints filling the atmosphere of God's heavenly temple and God's heavenly sanctuary. It's a sweet aroma unto the Lord. Not only can he smell them, that he can see them. He can hear them. He knows them. These are your prayers. And they represent the prayers of every man, woman, and child who's lost their lives for the sake of Jesus Christ. These are the prayers of every person, young and old, who cry out to God in life's uncertainties. Prayers like, Lord Jesus, when are you going to return? Or prayer like we hear in Revelation chapter 6, verse 10. O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell upon the earth? These bowls of incense are our prayers that are to remind us how much God loves us. Because God in his fullness, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, remind us to keep our focus on him. Because, again, that's where heaven's focus is. And when we do that, again, it helps us not focus on our problems that are out down here on earth. But all the while, we're focused on heaven. All the while, while heaven is focused on the Father. It's interesting to the note that you can somewhat imagine that Jesus' focus is on you. For didn't Jesus himself say this? For this is how God loved the world. You know this verse. He gave his one and only son that so whoever and everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. That's the depth of God's love. That's the depth of how much Jesus and the Lord Father and the Holy Spirit are focused on you. That he would send Jesus into the world to die for you. If you were the only soul ever on this earth he would have still gone to the cross just for you. The Father sent Jesus because you're the apple of his eye. And so as we see in Revelation chapter 5, now verses 9 through 10, the focus of Jesus' attention has been and always will be on you. We hear that in the song that the elders are singing. Whether you do it, hey, take the scroll, excuse me, and break its seven seals, for you were slaughtered, and your blood has ransomed people for God. You know, Jesus was slain to shed his blood to ransom you. It's easy to read that for the people of God, but he's saying that Jesus was ransomed. He was slaughtered. His blood was spilled to ransom you. Jesus was slain and shed his blood to give you a place of prominence in heaven as we continue to read to make you a, a kingdom of priests before the Lord and to reign with him on, on the earth. Think about that. That's a place of prominence in heaven. And to reign with him on this earth. Have you ever thought of yourself as royalty before? That's forever, by the way. 
So while all of heaven is keeping its focus on the Lord our God, Jesus' focus is on you by defeating death in the grave and honoring you before the Father in heaven and all of his angels. I want you to hear that one more time because I really want this to settle into your soul because as we go in over the next few weeks and we start to look at the stuff that's a little, mm, makes us cringe a little bit, we've got to remember that as we are focused on heaven and we keep our focus on heaven, that heaven is focused on you and keeping you in Christ. Jesus is focused on you. And because of all this, every day, every hour, every minute, Jesus should really be the focus of our lives. He should be on the forefront of our thoughts, day and night and night and day. Even when the days and nights are filled with uncertainties, God knows and hears when you cry out to him that you're looking heaven-bound. And he knows those troubles of the world that are coming against you. And he just wants you to focus on him so those things can fade away into the background. So as a modern contemporary song that we've heard often, which comes from Psalm 141, that we read earlier in our liturgy, so day and night, night and day, let your incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let your prayers arise. Let your evening sacrifice of prayers arise before the Lord. Because for unto him, unto the Lamb, your prayers are like incense. For unto the Father, your prayers are like incense. Because you who believe are the center of his creation. And you are the focus of his Son. The son that the father gave his life so that you could have life. And so because of these things, and we're going to land the plane right now. Today you can go forth from this place. You can go forth from this sanctuary knowing and really believing in your heart that today you can choose not to focus on your problems and your tribulations and the uncertainties that are all around us in this world. You can cause them to be blurred out and fade into the background when you instead choose to keep your focus on heaven above and the love of God that he has given unto you. Amen? And amen. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you loved us so much that you sent Jesus unto this earth to die for our sins, to be a ransom for us, that he spilled his blood on our behalf so that we could live. Father God, when life's troubles, when life's uncertainties come our way, help us to keep our heavenly focus on you. Yes, we can't ignore our problems. We can't ignore those things, but Help them not to jump in our face. Help them not to be a distraction from everything else in life, especially from you. Help us to focus on you and to pray to you and to ask you to intercede for us on behalf of our troubles, our uncertainties. And let those troubles, those uncertainties fade into the background and let you take care of what we cannot. Keep us tightly in the palm of your hand. Help us be victorious in Christ and help us have an everlasting peace in our hearts always until the very end of the age. And through Christ Jesus we pray, amen and amen and amen.